Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text before us this morning for our consideration is from John chapter 3. We read the 22nd verse. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing at Adon near Salim because there was plenty of water and the people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. This is God's word. <laughs> Dear friends in Christ, before we get into the major content of the sermon this morning, I'd like to just use one of the lines from the first verse. And Jesus went out and he spent some time with them. I appreciate that thought. Jesus was not just some great Messiah and preacher and teacher that was too good for the little people. But he spent time with them. You know, it makes one think that perhaps in the climate of our political nature here in this country, it would do us well to perhaps take time and listen to people a little bit. Hear what people have to say rather than to just lump into categories of us and them. Jesus spent a lot of time with the people. And it wasn't the elite necessarily, although there were some of those, and it wasn't necessarily the ones that had a lot of influence and power and money, although there were some of them. He spent time with the people, and especially did he spend time with his disciples. It's one thing to teach people. It's quite another to teach them and to be with them and to encourage them and to spur them on. One of the blessings of a congregation is we have a family of believers, a family who we don't know all the things that are going on in each other's lives, but we know enough where we can be sympathetic and concerning. If someone gets sick, it's a wonderful thing to see the congregation rally behind that individual and his family or her family and support them with their prayers and with their love and with their thoughts. That's why God places us in congregations, or one of the reasons anyway, is that, that fellowship and that, that unity that we have of, of being able to just to be able to spend time with each other and to be able to talk and so on. Jesus as instructor was equally important. I always appreciate when we have pastor's conferences and if some people from the Presidium of our district are there, president or vice president or someone, or else, when well, we have a professor there, we have in the evening on the first day what was referred to as Kabitli Kai. We go over and we have some snacks and things like that and small talk and, you know, how are the Packers doing and the Cubs going to win this year and all kinds of stuff. And there is the professor right in the midst of it. Oftentimes in blue jeans and a regular shirt and so on, just like the rest of us for the evening hours when all the, class and the meetings are over for the day. It means a lot. If the city president were to come in today and be in the fellowship area afterwards, you'd be visiting with you, talking about things, and you'd get to know them a little better. They are accessible. They are people that you can talk to. And there's a blessing in that. And so that little line about where Jesus spent some time with them, don't just pass that off as, well, he was, yeah, he was there for a while. No. There was some quality time that was spent by just being there and sharing each other's burdens, sharing each other's joys and, and such. And Jesus made sure that he did that. He was there for the people. He was concerned for them. There was a love that existed between he and those that he was with. Let us mute a rose. Oh, we always have those, don't we? Some little person that likes to stir the pot and, and bring up trouble when probably there isn't trouble that needs to be there. A dispute arose between John's disciples and a certain Jew. 
We don't know who this person was, but we know that it had something to do with the fact that Jesus' disciples were baptizing and John's disciples were baptizing, and something wasn't right with this scene. Now, if we go to chapter 4 before the speculation comes to our mind, wouldn't it have been wonderful to have been baptized by Jesus? If we go to chapter 4, verse 2, we see very clearly that Jesus himself was not baptizing. It was his disciples that were baptizing. So what was the dispute? We aren't told that either. Perhaps it was maybe how was the water being applied? Did they dip them in the river? Did they sprinkle them? Did they? I don't know. You can only speculate, but... John's disciples said, they're not doing it the way we do it. Or at least this person that stirs the pot was saying, yeah, Jesus' disciples are doing it different than you are. Or there's a matter here with the way they're doing it. And what's the result? More people are going off of Jesus. Ah, uh, now we get to the nub, don't we? The root of the matter. More people are going to Jesus. That means less people are coming to us. Humility and pride. They don't live in the same house. But oftentimes, pride likes to be that unwelcome guest that stays for a long time. John's disciples and Jesus' disciples had the same mission. It was the same work. It was kingdom work. And so if a few more were going over here and a few less were coming over here, it did not make the work over here any less important than the work being done over there. You know, it's not uncommon where we have new mission starts, where the existing congregation in the area gets a little bit disturbed by that because now they're taking away some of our members and some of the, they're going over to that mission start over there. Rather than thinking, what a wonderful opportunity. Perhaps with that mission start, we can have more people hear the gospel even still. Rather than thinking, they're taking some away from us. Well, if they're going over there, they're not being taken away from you. They're doing the same thing. And so this was the dispute that was going on. This is what caused the disciples of John to be upset. And notice, they didn't refer to him as Jesus or the one that you called the promised Messiah. That man. That man over there on the other side that you said these things about. Rather rude and rather disrespectful. But nevertheless, it's, it's that common human sinful pride that rears his ugly head. You know, there, there are certain things that we can do perhaps to rid ourselves of that one of which is to understand that you and I are not God I know that might be a obvious statement but you and I are not God so when things in life don't go the way that I want them to go and I'd much rather things would go in a different direction and other things would have happened I get upset rather than putting it into God's hands and allowing him to be God in my life and allowing him to work as he would. But we fight against that. If things are going poorly, then I get angry with God. If things are getting going well, I pat myself on the shoulder and think, boy, you're doing really well. All the while forgetting that, which is the second point, God gives us gifts. The series of readings that we began this morning from 1 Corinthians, we'll continue those for the next few Sundays, different gifts of the same spirit. Not all of us are the same. Not all of us can do the things that the other person can do. But yet together, we can do a lot of things. If the addition were left to me to build, we'd still be worshiping in the same way we were about 25 years ago, without one there. But God has given us people that could do that, and because of that, we've been able to have fellowship time and get to know each other even a little bit better, because everybody isn't 
rushing out because there's no room to greet and there's such congestion there at the door. If you relied on me to accompany the tunes for you on a Sunday morning, you would probably not know which one we were singing by the sound of what was coming out. If I were left to be the one that was teaching every single class here, we would either be here a long time on Sunday morning or you'd be coming in at various times during the week to make sure we got all the age groups and everything. No, God gives us people that have talents with their hands, people that have talents with their musical abilities, people that have talents with teaching. We have people that have talents with being just someone you can talk to, that can send out a greeting card that brightens the day of some individual because they know that someone is still thinking about them. They haven't been forgotten. Those are talents and blessings that God has given to each of us. Is my talent better than yours? Absolutely not. Is my talent different than yours? Absolutely. But it's all the same God. It's all the same work. And so we rejoice in the differences of gifts that we have. Also, in remaining humble in our life is we learn never to quit. How easy it would have been for John to say, well, if they're all going over to Jesus, what's the use of me preaching and teaching here anymore? What's the use of my ministry? The use of your ministry is the ones that are still coming to hear you. Be it four or six or eight or two, and there is 500 over there at that that place of worship, okay, you have the ones that God has for you to serve. I will for the rest of my life remember visiting with a pastor and his wife at the CLC Triennial Convention. And I believe he was from Finland, I might be wrong on that. He says, we are the only Lutheran church and thereby the only conservative Bible confessing and believing church in the country. And we have eight members. And that pastor serves those eight members every week. He is their pastor. He ministers to their spiritual needs. He prays with them. He teaches them God's word. And when one of, I believe it was the first vice president of our synod said to him, yeah, we average around 700 people on a, on a given Sunday for our worship services. And he says, oh, it would take 10 years for me to have that many people and to add them all together every Sunday. Never, ever feel bad about the few you are a part of or the many you are a part of all is the work of the Lord. Do not quit in that. If our congregation trickles down to only a handful left, then by God's grace we will continue to serve that trickle and we will continue to serve them faithfully preaching the word because that is what the Lord wants us to be doing. To be his witnesses, to encourage one another, to spur one another on, and to never quit or feel sorry for ourselves because then we lose sight of what the real picture is. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about me. The mission is that people could see Jesus. I would be not only offended, but I would be deeply concerned about my ministry if I ever thought that someone was coming here to see Pastor Newman on a Sunday morning. We came to see Jesus, but all we saw was Pastor Newman. He was doing this and he was doing that. And all. It was you know, so nice. Or we came to see Jesus, but all those children, they sang so well. And oh, they were so cute up there. Or we came to see Jesus. Oh, the choir was magnificent. Oh, it sounded like angels singing like I was in heaven. We need pastors. We need children. We need music. But more important, we need to see Jesus. 
if those things block our vision of Jesus, then we've lost sight of what our mission is and what our purpose is. And the same way with our individual callings as his witnesses. Well, I don't have many people that I know that I can talk to. Or Your circle is fine with as few or as many as you have. It is your mission field. It is the one that God gave to you. And it's no less important than anyone else's. When John's disciples were upset that more were going to Jesus, the question should have been, why are you upset? Isn't the message the same? Isn't the work the same? Whether a pastor wears white down, whether he is standing in the pulpit preaching or off in the, in the middle, whether there is a three-piece orchestra or band or musicians there playing, if the message is all about Jesus and it does not blind someone to Jesus, it's not wrong, it may be different. They may do things a little differently than we, we do, but it's still the mission of preaching Christ crucified to the sinner who desperately needs to hear that. A lot of times, we tend to lapse into that thinking of John's disciples, and we try to reach for things that could attract and everything. The means of grace does not cease attracting people. The power is in the means of grace, the word and the sacrament. As long as the word and sacrament are not hindered from being proclaimed and administered, God's work is being done. And it's being done to his glory. And the moment we begin to start thinking of this in terms of numbers and how many more are going one place and not another place, we lose sight of the mission. We lose sight of the purpose. We don't have these verses as part of our text this morning, but John handled this beautifully in a sense that should go down in, in, in infamy for just the, the, the brevity of it, but yet how much it means. He must increase and I must decrease. And that says it all. May the Lord be magnified among us. May his name be made holy and praised. And may the name that reminds us of all that was done for our salvation ever remain the focus. We thank God for the privilege to be able to serve as many or as few as he places before us. Because it is he who gives the gifts, he who gives the increase, and he who blesses our efforts. And so may we continue to work together by God's grace to be his witnesses, not looking over the fence and to see how other things are doing, but to understand what God wants us to be doing and what he wants you to be doing. May you rejoice in that opportunity to serve. And may you give thanks because God has given you a special gift. And if you don't know it now, you will in time and you will understand. This is God's opportunity that he gives to me to serve him. And with humility of mind and purpose, Lord, to you be the glory. Bless our efforts. Amen.